All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to see so many people already here at, at the first session. I mean, yeah, after the after the party, who went to the party? I mean, uh, I was there. Oh, quite quite some folks. Nice. It's always nice to see the line breakers. But the cover band after that was was really good. I, I really enjoyed the cover band as well. Nice. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, orchestrating your business logic reliably as workflow as code. Uh, and this is essentially a, a talk about Dapper Workflow, one of the newer uh, APIs in uh, Dapper uh, open source. Uh, I'll, I'll be also showing this QR code a uh, few times in, uh, at the start and also at the end. It's, it's also here on my shirt. Uh, it's actually a, a QR code that links to uh, uh, Holopin, and Holopin is a platform for to collect digital badges. Uh, so this actually links to uh, this community supporter badge. So if you like the Dapper project, you can uh, sort of uh, say, "Okay, I am a Dapper community supporter." So you can claim this uh, this badge. Uh, it, it requires a GitHub um, a GitHub account, but I assume most of you have a GitHub account, so that, that's probably fine. All right, um, so my name is Mark Duiker. I'm a developer advocate at Diagrid. Uh, that's a um, US-based uh, startup uh, founded by the co-creators of Dapper, uh, Mark Fossil and Jeroen Schneider. Uh, they both came out of Microsoft uh, because Dapper came actually from uh, Microsoft Research. Um, but uh, now they started their own company and they're now making uh, commercial products in the uh, Dapper ecosystem. Uh, but Dapper itself is completely open source, it's part of CNCF. Um, myself, I've been an Azure MVP for, for quite some years. I'm also one of the Dapper community managers, so there's a bi-weekly uh, community call that, that everyone can join and you get like the latest updates of, uh, of the Dapper project. Uh, so if you ever want to um, be part of that and have something to share, may maybe some of you are using Dapper. Are there Dapper users here already or not so much? No, okay, then, uh, then then I'll give a quick intro in, into Dapper as well. Uh, and I really like pixel art, so that's why this whole slide deck is pixel art themed. Uh, I've also put quite some stickers out there in, in, the, in the main area, uh, also pixel art style. Uh, I, I made them, so I hope you like them. So what I'm going to talk about today is first I, I give you uh, like a small Dapper introduction. I think that's that's useful. Then a bit about workflows in general, and then I'll cover some of the um, specific workflow patterns that you can do uh, with uh, with Dapper, such as chaining, fan out, fan in, uh, monitor pattern, external events, and even child workflows. But we'll see how much time we have because it's probably too much for this 45 minutes. Um, in the end, if there's time, there's a Q&A. Uh, if there's not a, not enough time, I'll stick around afterwards. You can ask me ask me questions later. Um, so a lot of especially big organizations are building these kind of systems, right? They're building distributed systems with multiple services, sometimes called microservices, and they, they, they all need to interact with each other in, in a safe way. They also need to uh, communicate with external resources like, like databases or message brokers, uh, etc. Um, but if, if you're in this kind of business, yeah, then it's actually quite challenging to make this like a proper architecture, right? Because they're quite all right. So there are quite a bit of developer challenges when you do like distributed systems, right? Because you want, of course, like you want to secure messaging between your systems, right? So you want to kind of secure communication. Uh, you also would like to do like end-to-end -end tracing, right? So not only when you do like service to service calls, but also service to a pub sub broker and then to uh, to the subscriber. So you would like to have some tracing. Um, what, what, what if the communication with some services fail, right? You want to do like automatic retries and stuff like that. So there's actually quite a lot of things going on if you want to like proper uh, distributed um, um, applications. So that, that's where Dapper comes in. Eh? So Dapper is suitably written to help you with this. So it's a distributed application runtime. Uh, I think it's now about four years old now, like I mentioned. It came from Microsoft, but it's now part of CNCF. It's like a, quite a big open source project. And it really helps with speeding up microservice development by providing an integrated set of APIs for communication, state, and, and workflow. And the workflow part will be focusing on it later, but um, I'll, I'll give a quick highlight of, of Dapper. So Dapper has like built-in security also resiliency and also observability uh, so you don't, you don't have to build that yourself or take a dependency on all kinds of different packages if you uh, if you want to do this and uh, Dapper runs on all of the major clouds because most of the people who use Dapper run it on top of kubernetes or some form of managed kubernetes so it basically runs uh, runs anywhere uh, and Dapper is quite a big open source project. I think there, there's over like 3,000 contributors uh, now over the years, uh, but there's also quite a, some big organizations are contributing to it significantly. Uh, of course, Microsoft is there because it came from Microsoft, but also Amazon is contributing and Intel, so quite some big names uh, behind it. So it's really qu quite a mature uh, project. So, like I mentioned, Dapper provides a suite of APIs that developers can use to quickly build services. No. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail into all of them because there are quite a lot of APIs. We'll, we'll focus on, uh, on on the workflow one uh, a bit later. Uh, I do want to mention it how um, how you as developer can use uh, these these APIs. 
because um, Dapper runs in a separate process, it runs in a sidecar, so your application talks uh, to the Dapper API that runs in this sidecar, and you can use any language for your own application, hey, because Dapper, you can call it via HTTP or GPC. There all are also some, some client libraries that you can use, um, but you don't have to take a dependency uh, hey, to one of the Dapper SDKs. If you don't want to, you can just use plain HTTP GRPC calls. So, for instance, if you want to uh, invoke a method on another service, you can make uh, make a post um, uh, call to this invoke uh, endpoint, for instance. If you want to retrieve a bit of state, you can do like a get to this state endpoint. And if you want to publish a message to uh, the, the order messages topic on, uh, on a pop sub broker, you can do a post. If you want to retrieve a, um, a secret, you can use the secrets endpoint. And we'll be talking about this one, the, uh, the workflows. Um, so uh, that's important to know. Um, you can just write your applications in whatever language you want. You will be talking to a Dapper API uh, that runs in the Dapper sidecar. Okay, so very quickly, so ha having these whole set of APIs, th that's nice for developers to have because th they can be up and running and building uh, microservices very quickly with all of these, uh, these features. But the nice thing about Dapper is that the underlying resources are decoupled from the APIs. Yeah? So for instance, you can do state management, but, but Dapper itself, it's, it's, it's not, not a database, right? But you can do publish subscribe, but Dapper itself is not a pub sub broker. But there are over 100 components that integrate with Dapper. So you can do state management yeah, with all of the major cloud providers. You can use yeah, any, any pub sub service out there because Dapper integrates with it. Yeah, so for all of the APIs out there, there are many different resources that you can use. And uh, the, the, those are, the, of course, the, the big cloud resources yeah, in, in either AWS or, or Azure or GCP, but also uh, lots of um, uh, open source uh, things as well. But then we'll, we'll be zooming in into, into workflows now. So what is a workflow? Well, basically, it's a sequence of tasks or activities that are performed to accomplish a specific goal. I think that's, that's quite straightforward. I think this is the, the Wikipedia definition of it. Um, and over the years, there haven't quite some uh, workflow or business process automation tools, right? And probably some of you have, have used some of these. Uh, I've used like Microsoft BizDoc server. I think that's been around for like 20 years now or something. I've been a big fan of, of Azure Durable Functions. Who, who has used that, Durable Functions? Okay, right, so some people, so you'll, you'll see that the API of Durable Functions and the API of Dapper is almost the same, and that's because it's written by the same person. Um, but uh, in, in general, I think workflow-based tools that are based on, on the code are, yeah, I, I think, I, I, I have a strong preference for them because uh, it's easy to understand for developers, right? You can usually uh, also uh, test them very well. You can write unit tests against your, your workflow. So I think for developers, these, these workflow as code solutions are, are very nice. The nice thing about Dapper is that uh, the workflow API, it can be combined with the other Dapper APIs, right? So you can combine workflow with uh, the PubSub API or you combine workflow with, with the state management API. So it integrates nicely in your, yeah, in your Dapper toolbox. Okay, so there are some workflow patterns that, that, that enable you to, uh, to write or to orchestrate your services with Dapper Workflow. So I'll, I'll cover some of them first in the slides and then I'll give some demos around these things. So the first one is um, activity chaining or task chaining. And this is where the order is important, right? So you start with activity one and uh, then the orchestrator, uh, the orchestration uh, or the workflow will wait until activity one is finished. Then it will move on to activity two. And then uh, when that's finished, it will move on to activity three and then it's done. I'll, I'll zoom in a bit later on um, how, how, this, how this order and what, what the workflow is doing. And, but this is basically what's what happening. So the order of execution is important here. Another method is uh, fan out, fan in. And here the order is not important, right? So the, the orchestration will start and it will do as many of tasks uh, uh, to execute or schedule uh, as many in parallel as possible. Uh, but the, all these activities, they have no relationship with each other, so they can be uh, executed in, in batches. What the workflow actually will do, it, it, it will wait until completion, until all of these activities have been completed. So at the end, you can do some aggregation over the results of these individual activities. And so this is very useful for so some kind of a batch processing, for instance, and you want to, uh, to make some sum at the end. Then there's a monitor pattern. So here you usually start with some activity. It could be like a cleanup job, for instance, maybe you want to clean up some, some VMs in the cloud and you do it on a daily basis or an hourly basis. So you, you do that activity, you clean up some resources, uh, and then you usually probably wait for a certain amount of time. Uh, but then you instruct the workflow to actually uh, continue again. Yeah? So it's basically like a while loop, uh, but instead of uh, using the, the while actually in your workflow code, you say to the workflow, okay, continue as a new instance and then the workflow will actually start again doing the same thing. 
So you can also use timers in uh, in, in workflows yeah, because workflows can can be actually very long running. It can yeah, it can be from several seconds to maybe several months or, or, or years uh, because the, the, the state is being persisted. Uh, we we'll come back to that later. But we can actually um, start a workflow and then use a timer and say, okay, you have to wait one hour or maybe we, we give an absolute date. We say, okay, you can only continue when it's the 1st of December, 2023. And when the time is there, then the activity will be executed and then the uh, workflow will end. So you can do some very, very nice yeah, scheduling with, with workflows as well. Then the external system interaction. So that's that's quite an interesting one because usually there are some like either um, there's some human uh, human in intervention involved or has some, some other external system uh, that that's that's, in, that's involved. So what what can happen here is uh, let's say you you want to um, uh, request some kind of a budget for something. So uh, you start a workflow. Uh, there's an activity that uh, sends a notification to your manager, uh, but your manager has to give some kind of approval. Um, so after that activity is done, the workflow will be in wait mode and it will wait until it receives an event uh, from another system or uh, maybe your manager clicks on a button from yes, uh, I approve or, or, I, or I reject your request. Uh, and once that event has been received, then the workflow continues again and uh, it, it, you can uh, supply any payload to this event. So you can, based on the payload, you can actually check from, okay, uh, this, this approval is rejected, so I, I choose this branch of the workflow, or the, uh, the, the event is approved, uh, so I actually choose the approved branch of the workflow. So it's quite normal in your workflow to have like if-else statements with different activities. Okay, so let's talk a bit in more in detail about the workflow engine. So uh, you, you have your workflow app and that contains, uh, because I'm now talking about .NET, because you can actually use different languages with Dapper and also with workflows, but I think most of you are using .NET. That's also my background. So you write your workflow in .NET and also your, your activities in .NET. They're just the class definitions. Um, but then there's the Dapper workflow engine that runs in the Dapper sidecar that takes care of all of the scheduling. Yeah, so that's the workflow engine. And what the workflow engine will do, yeah, it will communicate with your workflow app, but it will also do a lot of communicating with an, an append-only state store. Because what happens every time you start a workflow and every time a activity is started or finished, it will actually uh, persist that state, that event, to an append-only state store. So that's what makes these um, workflows durable. Uh, all events are stored. Uh, and in case your workflow app uh, crashes or malfunctions for some reason, and we uh, and that workflow app comes back. All of these state, all of these events are then rehydrated uh, by the workflow engine, and then the workflow engine can continue again where it was. The workflow engine um, actually is built on top of Dapper Actors. Uh, so Dapper Actors has also uh, a Dapper API, so it uses Actors under the hood. So it's, it's not very important for you to know, but uh, there is some logging in, in the console uh, about Actors. So as soon as we We'll uh, go into the demos. Then we will see some notifications about Dapper Actors. And that's because the workflow engine is using Dapper Actors under the hood. So there's a workflow actor. And so for every uh, workflow instance that you start, there's a new um, uh, actor instance as well that persists its own state. And for each activity type that the workflow has, there's also an instance of a uh, Dapper activity actor. So the workflow engine uh, actually doesn't have any state, but the workflow actors and the activity actors, they do have their own state. But uh, it's, it's mostly an implementation detail. So uh, your workflow app, that contains the definition of, uh, of the workflow and all of the activities. Uh, and then uh, the responsibility of the of the, uh, the Dapper runtime of the workflow engine is to actually uh, schedule and manage all these uh, activity executions and also um, do retries. Um, and all of the events are stored in this append-only uh, state store. All right, so now an important point uh, about the durability of the workflows. Um, because when you start a workflow, it's not executed just once, it will actually be replayed a couple of times. Uh, I will also show this in the demo, but I think it's good if you all already see it like visualized like this. So um, what happens when we start a workflow, um, the, the workflow engine will actually uh, already checkpoint that state of starting workflow and its input to the state store. And so that information is, is stored. Um, then activity one will be scheduled and that will also be um, stored in, in the state store. Um, what happens when activity one is completed, uh, then it won't immediately go to activity two. Now what happens then is the workflow will actually replay. So the workflow actually start again. 
uh, then the workflow will recognize that activity two has already been executed because that's, that has been stored in, in a database. So it won't execute activity one again, but it just rehydrates that state from the state store. And then it will continue to activity two. Right? And the same thing happens again. Yeah? So after activity two is done, uh, we won't immediately go to activity three. No, the workflow then replays again, it starts from the top, and then it will see that, okay, activity one has been done. Yes, I will rehydrate the state. Activity two has been done. I will rehydrate the state. And then we go to activity three. Right? And the same thing happens again. And now for the final time, the, yeah, the workflow or the, the, the runtime will see that, okay, all of these activities have been executed. I will re rehydrate the state. And now I've been, uh, now it's completed. So I think it's important to realize because if you put a breakpoint in your workflow and you will, you, you actually see that, yeah, you, you will stop multiple times in your workflow because of this replay nature. But this is what workflow makes, makes it, yeah, stateful and durable. All right, I'll show some demos now. All the demos are in this um, uh, GitHub repo. It's, it's all out in the open. So you can definitely uh, play with this later. Uh, so the first one will be like a super basic one and hello world, an orchestration with just one activity. It's not a realistic example because normally you would use workflows to orchestrate many different activities, um, but this is just the most basic thing uh, for you to, to see first. Uh, is this big enough for everyone? Yeah, all right. Um, so uh, this, this repo contains a couple of folders. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, be using the, the basic workflow samples folder. Um, there are some more extended samples here but please watch them, watch them yourself. So this contains a, um, a .NET application. If you look at the uh, CS project file, yeah, it's based on um, ASP.NET, it's uh, .NET 7. And we have a dependency on dapper.workflow. Yeah? So if you want to author, if you want to write workflows, you need a dependency on, uh, on, on dapper workflow because you need to write .NET classes that contains a definition of a workflow. Um, right, and let's actually have a look at uh, the first workflow. That's the hello world workflow, that's this. So as you can see, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's just a, a plain uh, .NET class we're inheriting from a workflow. Yeah? So this is a, a base class that that's, uh, that's comes from the Dapper workflow package. And here you specify what the input type is and what the output type is. In this, time, in this case, it's just simple, uh, simple um, types. It can be just any POCO type, as long as it's uh, serializable. Um, when you inherit from this base class, you need to override one method. That's the run async method. And that gives you access to a workflow context that you can use. Uh, and again, you have to specify the input there and, and this then, then the output. So everything in workflows is asynchronous. Uh, so everything else, uh, is async and then using tasks. So with that context, you can now call out to different activities. Eh? So that's the call activity async method. And yeah, people who did like dribble uh, functions uh, will realize, okay, it's the, the exact same method call. So you specify the output type that you expect. Uh, you uh, specify the name of the activity that, that you want to call, and this is just based on, on, a, on a string. And you specify the input, and what you get back is a message. Uh, so let's have a look what the, uh, what, what the activity looks like. So this is the activity method. Again, an activity is just a class. We, again, uh, have a base class from the Dapper workflow package. Uh, and the signature is the same. We have an input type, an output type. Again, we need to override the run async method. In this case, we have a workflow activity context that we can use, and there's an input. So what this activity does, it, we, have, we have an array of, um, of different greetings. We randomly select one of the greetings, and we put it in front of uh, the input that we get. Right? So it, it will pick randomly one of these things. That's also important to know about uh, workflows. So in the workflow code itself, and this code, you only need to, uh, to do uh, like a deterministic code. So that means uh, you, you only schedule activity calls here and you have if else statements and, and those kind of things. Um, but you actually shouldn't use any um, uh, date times or create new GUIDs in here um, because everything that's used as an input for, uh, for these activities, uh, that will be stored in the append only database and that will be replayed. But as soon as you use some non-deterministic code like date times or GUIDs, those signatures will not match anymore when the workflow replays and then generates a new GUID because then uh, had the, the corresponding um, um, record in the state store will not match anymore. So then the, the replay nature uh, is, is broken. So uh, using workflows, but that's the same thing with any workflow system. Uh, the workflow code needs to be determ deterministic. So any, anything non-deterministic, calling out to different endpoints, calling out to databases, uh, that needs to happen in activities. 
Okay, so this is the activity. Uh, this is the workflow. In order to get this to work, we need to do one more thing. We have to register the, um, uh, the workflow and the activity. So if I look at the uh, program file here, um, we have like a builder.services, and then there's like an extension method called add Dapper workflow. And here we have some options that, and here we register our workflows and activities so Dapper can actually uh, recognize uh, that, that this is a project uh, with workflows and activities. And in, in my case, it's, it's um, a bit different because I'm doing a demo. So I have a whole list of workflows and just uh, one activity. And when, when you're doing this yourself, you probably have just one workflow or two and then a whole list of activities. Uh, but I'm reusing this one activity uh, just to keep things simple for the demos. So, but once you have created your workflow and your activity and you have registered them, and, uh, then we can actually start this application and, and then we can test them. Uh, it was actually still running, so let me actually stop this. Um, so hey, when you when you use Depper, you have to uh, you use the Depper CLI uh, locally, and that uh, requires uh, the, the Docker. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm running Docker under the hood, uh, Docker Desktop. It also comes with a couple of um, um, uh, containers, right? One, one, one for state, because of course uh, the, the workflow state needs to be persisted somewhere. Uh, and in this case, um, I'm using a, a local Redis container for for the state. Um, when I start uh, uh, my application, I can do like dapper run dash f and then a dot because uh, this will actually instruct um, uh, dapper uh, to run everything that's that's been written in this dapper.yaml file. So if you want to run multiple services, this is actually a useful way to configure all of your um, um, all of your dapper services. In this case, I have only one service. My, my, my basic workflow uh, service uh, and that will have a certain application port and a certain uh, Dapper port uh, which I'll use to communicate with uh, and it's using .NET Run uh, as to, to actually run the application. Um, so I'm going to run this now. All right, it's there. Then one of these statements should be this. So sidecar work item streaming connection established. So that means that there is a connection established between uh, my workflow application, my .NET application, and the Dapper sidecar that has the, uh, the Dapper uh, runtime. So that means uh, we're, we're good to go. So I will be um, uh, using the Dapper API, the HTTP API to just kick off some of these workflows now. So normally you would have like a, a separate client application uh, calling out uh, they're starting these workflows. Uh, I don't have a client application. I just have some HTTP calls here. I'm using the VS Code REST client. Anyone familiar with, with this REST client? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so some people use like Postman. It's, it's, it's very, very familiar. Uh, but I'm using a REST client and um, that allows you to, rake, to, to write these, yeah, these, these text-based files with um, a .htp or .rest extension. Uh, but now there's some kind of a button here, you see, like send request. And now I can actually make a request that will now do a post to my local Dapper URL, which is just local host and the Dapper port. Uh, and that will call out to the workflows endpoint. Uh, and I'm using the, head, the, the Dapper implementation of a workflow. And I'm calling out, and I want to start the hello world, hello world workflow. I'm going to start it, and then there's an optional parameter to um, pass in an instance ID. So this instance ID will be the identifier for the workflow. Uh, it's optional because if you don't pass in an instance ID, um, Dapper will create one for you and also will give it back. Um, I just like to create one explicitly. Uh, and the payload will be a string world. Uh, so let's run this, and then um, the result, the, the response will be shown here on the right. So I will, I will click this. Then here we have the result. And the result is not the result of the workflow, eh? because we don't see something a greeting with the world. No, what we get back is an instance ID. And that's also the instance ID that I passed in. But since workflows are asynchronous, eh, uh, we don't know uh, if the workflow is, is very short living or very long living, right? I mean, may, maybe we started a workflow that will run for months, right? So it doesn't make sense to, to, to wait for the response. Uh, so we have to actually get the response. So what we need to do here is, oh, I don't need this. Um, so what we need to do is we need to do a get, again, to the workflow endpoint, and then a pass in the ID of the workflow, because we want to get the result of a specific workflow uh, instance. So that's what we're doing here. And this is what we get back now. So uh, we, we have the result now of the Hello World workflow. Uh, we see that the runtime status is completed, so that's a good sign. Uh, other statuses are like failed or running, for instance. And we see the input world, and here we see the output, high world. So this is how you uh, retrieve the state of a workflow. 
And by the way, uh, it, it's not mandatory to have like a, a state coming out of a workflow, right? Because it's very common to have like a final activity in a workflow and that final activity then um, uh, either uh, put something in a database or uh, put something on a, a message broker and that's then the uh, final result of a workflow. So your workflow doesn't need to have an output. All right, so that's the, uh, that's the first sample. Oh. Let's get back to um, another example, which is a bit, bit more realistic. So that's the chain example. So that's what, what you would normally do, uh, is chain multiple activities uh, in one go. Uh, in this case, um, I'm just chaining the same activity. So I will do like a chain three, uh, create greeting activities. So let's have a look. So I'm, I'm still using the same activity, so we don't have to look into that. Uh, so this is the chaining workflow sample. Uh, so again, we inherit from workflow, we override the run async method. Uh, there are some stuff committed out, but um, uh, I'll undo that uh, shortly because you can then see the replay in nature. Um, but what will happen now is I, I will call this um, uh, call activity async three times. Yes, because we want to call this create greeting activity three times. Um, and the first time I will use the input that I um, get straight from the workflow input. Uh, but then I have a result, message one, uh, and I use the message one output here as the input for the next one, uh, and so on. Yeah? So the next one is message two, I'm using that for the next one. Yeah? So this is really the, the chaining effect. I'm using the output from a previous acti activity as an input for the next activity. All right, uh, so let's run this first and see what, what, um, what the output is. I mean, the output will be a bit weird, right? Because we get some kind of concatenation of greetings uh, with all of these inputs. So let's run this. So it's the chaining request. So the input will just be word, a world, uh, but it will be now like a strange concatenation of, of greetings. So let's go. Again, hey, we just get a two to accept it back with the instance ID because now we need to actually uh, do a get of the chaining and that contains actual results. You, you already see I do some console log statements here at the bottom as well. So here you can see like hey, this was the first input of the activity. This was the second input of the activity and this was the third input of the activity. Uh, but the final result is then this so the final result is hey hey konnichiwa world all right um, now let's actually uh, stop the uh, execution and uh, let's uncomment some of these things because then you can see the actual replay nature so so i just put in some some console write line statements and we can actually um, um, monitor in the in the terminal what's going on uh, what happens if we run this workflow Okay, so what is very convenient about this workflow context is that you can actually check if the if the workflow is actually replaying. So what, what happens here is I, I start this, I will check from A, is, is this a replay of this workflow or is it the, the, the first time that's executing, right? So initially it will be the first execution, um, but then it will actually replay uh, after every time one of these activities has been finished. So we'll also see some replay stuff here. Uh, and uh, there's actually some console write lines before uh, executing one of these things. Okay, so let's do, uh, build this again. All right, and let's start everything again. Okay, so now we're going to run uh, the same thing, uh, but now we will uh, monitor here in the terminal what, what's going on. So again, I'm going to do the same chaining workflow one, that's this. All right, so let's have a look. So we see here, first execution of the workflow, right? That makes sense, nothing is replaying. Then we are going to uh, call activity one, and we see here that activity one is actually called. Okay, still makes sense. Then the workflow is replayed, right? Just as I shown earlier. So now we have a replay of the workflow. Um, and then um, and the workflow will, uh, will, will want to schedule activity one, but activity one has already been performed. So it's not being executed again, but the state is rehydrated. Then we will schedule activity two, that has actually been executed then the workflow has been replayed again. Uh, then uh, it will schedule one, but that's already there, so it's rehydrated. Activity two has also been executed, so it will be rehydrated. Re rehydrated. Uh, then it will execute uh, activity three, that has not been executed yet, so it will do activity three. And then it will do the final replay uh, when it finally checks, okay, I've done all of these activities, uh, and then we have actually completed the workflow. Uh, so this is important to realize that, uh, that your workflow will execute multiple times. Yeah, but it will never um, execute your activity multiple times, right? Because uh, it, it knows where, um, what the state is. All right. 
So that's, uh, so it's chaining. Let's move on to the next one. That's a uh, fan out, fan in. Yeah? So here the order is not important. And so we, we can schedule as many of these things uh, in parallel. Uh, that is this one. All right. So, so this looks a bit different. So again, here we override the run async method, but then uh, the first thing I do is I have I define a task and I actually I define a list of task string and the task string is actually the output of the activity. Uh, and what I get as input is actually an array of strings. Yeah, so my input is a list of, in this case, um, uh, city names. So that's my input. Then I iterate through that, um, uh, that array. And then I am uh, calling again, call activity async yeah, with the same activity. But notice that I'm not using await here. So we are not awaiting that activity um, um, call. So we are not actually doing any scheduling or execution here yet. We just have the definition of the activity but we are not executing it yet. But this list of, uh, of, of tasks, that will contain all of the activity definitions. And the magic then happens here, this line. So here we do await task when all, and we provide all of the tasks. Uh, and this instructs uh, the Dapper runtime to schedule all of them, uh, but also uh, wait uh, until all of these tasks have been actually finished. And then we can aggregate the results, which is now in messages. Okay, so let's uh, execute this. So this is the fan out, fan in. So have we, uh, this is the workflow that we're going to start, fan out, fan in workflow, and this is the payload. Yeah? So Amsterdam, Porto, New York. So let's run this. Okay, and let's actually get the result. This one. All right. Yeah, so this is our input uh, with, 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 with some uh, white space. So we have Amsterdam, Porto, New York was the input, and this is now the output. Yeah? Bonjour, Amsterdam, Bonjour, Porto, and Guten Tag, New York. All right. Yeah, so fan out, fan in is, is ideal for things that have no relation uh, with, with each other. All right, let's see, am I doing on time? Yeah, okay. Um, the monitor one, yeah, so yeah, the, 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 the thing that you want to, let's say, repeat in a loop. So let's have a look at that. All right, um, this is the monitor workflow. So again, I am first doing a, a uh, an execution of an activity, uh, but now my input is actually a counter. And as long as this counter is uh, below 10, and I, and I will start with zero, and so as long as this counter is uh, below 10, I will increment the counter and I will uh, start a timer to introduce like a bit of a delay. So I'm actually having a delay of one second. And then I instruct the workflow to continue as a new instance. And that, that means it's, it won't have its execution history anymore. Um, and I pass in a new state for that counter. Right, so I start with zero, and then I increment to, to one. Yeah, so I start a new instance and then with one as the, as the input. So I will do this like then 10 times, right? Because then the counter is uh, and not, not equal to 10 anymore. And then I will return. In this case, it's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a silly example, uh, hey, but you can imagine that uh, in, in, in your case, when I mentioned about the, the, the cloud resource cleanup, uh, so um, this activity could be cleaning up some, some resources and getting back uh, some, some kind of a state information that hey, maybe some resources are not completely removed yet. So you can then uh, do something based on that output. Uh, so maybe you get back some resources which are uh, not cleaned up yet. Uh, so instead of this if statement, you can do some if statements about the state that you get back from that uh, instruction to clean up some cloud resources, for instance. But this is something that yeah, you would typically do in, in these uh, monitoring things, right? You, you, you check something and based on, based on the, either the output of that or based on some input, uh, you either wait and continue as new. All right, so let's execute this. So that's the monitor workflow. So we start with zero and we, we will see here uh, underneath here uh, what the activities and, and also the inputs will be. Uh, I will also um, very quickly will uh, call a get because then you'll see that the workflow status uh, is, is in running instead of uh, uh, just completed. So I will start this, then I'll do a get and you see it's running and it's now at input two, input five, you also see it in the terminal, input seven, it's still running and now it's done. Yeah, so we finally have an output, hey, 10. Okay, so this is ideal for, for scheduling stuff. Okay, so uh, I won't demo the timer uh, because then I have, to, I have to set a very specific timer and then we have to wait and we have to watch until the timer is, has passed and it's a bit boring, so let, let's not uh, do that. Uh, I will do this one, the external system interaction. So that is this one. Okay, what will happen here is, um, again, I over override the run async method. 
um, we define uh, the output, which is first empty. I define a timeout, and I will, I will get to that shortly. And what we then do is, um, instead of first executing activity and, and then waiting for an event, we immediately wait for an external event. Yeah, so we use the context. We say, okay, wait for an external event before continuing. We're waiting for an event uh, type uh, of approval event. Um, but yeah, as, as with anything with, with workflows, we are also um, um, uh, specifying names for events and wait and names for activities. So we are waiting for an event named approval event that has this type. And uh, this actually is very simple. It just has a Boolean is approved and that's it, but it could be a, a bigger object. Um, so I'm also specifying this timeout. So this is optional, uh, but I, I always suggest that please use this timeout because if you are waiting for an external event and don't pass in a timeout uh, and no event will come in, then the, the workflow will be running forever, right? Uh, so uh, I, I don't think that that's good. Also, also not, not in the business process rise, right? It's probably not very logical to have a workflow running forever. You probably have some kind of a default timeout anyway, right? So probably 20 seconds is a bit short, yeah? but if you're, let's say, uh, requesting a holiday and your manager needs to approve, well, maybe you have like a default timeout of maybe uh, seven days or something. And then maybe you have like a, a backup plan, right? So if something doesn't come in within seven days, maybe you escalate then to uh, the, the, the manager of the manager, something like that, right? That, that's business logic you can you can imp implement yourself. Uh, but, but please always supply a, a timeout, provide a timeout. Um, so when a approval event is received, uh, then the orchestration will, will continue. Um, and then you can actually check uh, the, the uh, that approval event type. So if it is approved, then I will execute an activity. So that then contains my result. Um, if I do, and, and, yeah, and if there's if the if it's not approved, and then I have just uh, this basic. Uh, uh, then my message is empty. Um, but in your case, you can also have like a different else statement for uh, for the output, right? If your approval event uh, does not happen within the 20 seconds, uh, then the Debra runtime will actually. Um, uh, throw a task ca cancelled exception. So I'm catching that task cancelled exception here. Then I'm setting a custom status, uh, but in your case, hey, you can also do some kind of a compensation action or do something else, make another activity call. In this case, I'm just updating the status and then uh, returning uh, returning an empty message. Okay, so let's run this as the uh, final example. Uh, so that is uh, this one, so it's the external interaction. So again, I'm just uh, putting in uh, uh, word, uh, world as an input. Um, I will do that, and then I will let's uh, then I will immediately raise an event. So that's the next one. And raising an event, you always need to do that uh, for a specific workflow instance ID, right? So I get the workflow instance ID back. I capture that in, in this variable. So the next call I'm doing is uh, I'm raising an event for a specific workflow ID, and the event name is approval event. Uh, and then I say, okay, approved is true. Uh, so this is the uh, the, the happy happy path. Okay, so I'm calling this. It's now started. I'm raising the event. And we see here it, it, it ex it's executed here. So if I retrieve the state, it has completed. World, all our world. So all is good. Um, so so now let's uh, let, let's do the the, the un unhappy path, uh, and that's actually not raising any event. So I will do this. I start the workflow. Uh, but now we have to uh, wait, uh, wait, uh, wait, wait a bit of time. Um, so what will happen is, if I scroll back far enough to show you this again. So what will happen in this case is hey, we will actually catch the task cancelled exception and we set a, a custom status. And now indeed I really see some logging that it is completed. So here are our workflow will not will not be failed eh, because we're actually catching this exception. We're just setting setting the uh, the custom status for it. Um, so if we get the get the information now, is okay. Eh? So it's still completed, uh, but now we have this custom message saying eh, we we were waiting, but it's cancelled because we have like a timeout. And that's it. But it's of course totally up to you uh, how you want to implement this. All right. Um, this is another one I'm not going to demo it because we're almost out of time, but you can actually compose workflows out of other workflows. So uh, that, that would be useful if you have, have some kind of a, either a complex long workflow and you want to reuse some, some workflow components. Uh, so you can actually yeah, create 
a, a main workflow that calls like sub workflows. Um, it, it, it's nice, but also be careful with this, right? Because you can create a main workflow that calls a sub workflow, that calls a sub workflow, that calls a sub workflow, and you can have a very deep nesting of workflows, and it won't be very obvious for the developer how deep this nesting goes, right? So that, that can also be a bit uh, tricky. Um, there is one thing I would like you to see though, and where are we? Oh. That is this, um, because it's, it's about distributed tracing, right? So Dapper has observability built in, uh, and we can actually um, use something like Zipkin or any other observability tool um, to actually see what, what is happening uh, with, with workflows. Um, so in this case, uh, it was the external interaction workflow here as an example, and that has like three, three spans. Oh, that's my timer. That's, that's me. Um, so you can, you, you can actually use your observability tools to see, okay, how, um, what, what were the, the timings involved in this executing this, this workflow, right? And what kind of activities were involved? So in this case, in this case we can see that there was, there was a timer involved. Um, but if you, if you look at some other examples, uh, I'm now limited to, to 10 results. But yeah, uh, you, you, can, you, can, you, can use, you can use this tool to actually get some insights in um, your, the performance of your workflow. So I think that that's very valuable because uh, some activities may be um, maybe not so performant because you're calling out to databases or uh, doing some, some REST calls, which, which might take a bit long. So uh, use the built-in uh, observability tools uh, that comes with Dapper uh, to actually yeah, uh, inspect uh, the performance of your workflow. I think that's, uh, that's useful to know. All right, uh, that's it. Um, yeah, so uh, if you enjoyed this, if you like Dapper, uh, feel free to, to, to claim this Holopin badge. And, um, I, will, I will create some more badges as well later for if you want to contribute to Dapper, and um, I, will, I will create more. Like I mentioned, all of the code is, is in the public, and um, it's out there, so feel free to, to try it on your own. Um, if you're interested in Dapper and have more questions, there's a Dapper Discord. There's like, uh, I think, on almost 7,000 uh, members. Um, so if you need some more information, need some help, uh, that's the best place to go. And yeah, if there are more questions, feel free to, uh, to ask me. Thanks.